gosh. Excuse my puppy. I'm going to put myself on mute as soon as I can. So I just want to. Monty. Monty. All right. Hi. So I'm Michelle Piskin. I am the Vice President of Education and Training here at Caring Kind. Um, and I welcome you all tonight to this wonderful um, seminar led by Pam on sex and sexuality, which um, I'm so happy that she's back again with us. So a little bit about Pam. So Pam Atwood is a gerontologist, a licensed professional counselor, um, an author, um, an experienced dementia specialist. In addition to, um, to owning her own business, Dementia Group Consulting Coaching, which is in Connecticut, Pam and her husband, Tom, have co-authored a total engagement activities for growth and expression in older adults, a book. Um, Pam currently has a series of children's books. She's a sought after speaker on a variety of topics such as veterans with PSD and dementia, humor as a coping strategy, intimacy and sexuality and dementia, which we're gonna hear about tonight, perfect in times for Valentine's Day, she has worked in aging services for well over 30 years, um, volunteers to facilitate support groups for the Alzheimer's Association, American Parkinson's Disease Association. Um, Pam is a proud graduate of Clark University, University of St. Joseph's, and Southern New Hampshire University. Um, and I am very pleased to have Pam here tonight. Um, to, to give us um, this, this, this seminar. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Pam. Pam, I'm gonna check the chat for you. Um, okay, great, thanks, Michelle. And I know we will all be captivated by what you have to say. Well, thank you. So welcome everybody to Monday Night Educational Meeting with Pam Atwood. And thank you all for coming out on this free snow, depending on where you are, evening. I know the entire city is shutting down. Um, where I live, everything's shutting down and we're getting warnings about Storm Lorraine. And my goodness, you would think that it was the first time any of us got any snow. Um, I'm in Connecticut and here we all own Subaru, excuse me, we all own Subarus, but are afraid of driving in the snow. It makes no sense to me, but there it is. Um, and let's see, it looks like we're still going to be waiting on a lot of folks to come in. We aren't sure. I wasn't sure. Michelle said it was a pretty good mix of families um, and and uh, community-based caregivers and healthcare professionals. So I've written the presentation really for both. Um, this is very much an interactive conversation. I don't want this to be didactic. It gets boring for you. It gets boring for me. And come on, guys, it's sex. So we're going to expect to have some conversation. I know we're all shy about it. I only get to do this because I don't blush when I start talking about sex. I don't know why. Someone asked me today if my chair making a noise was actually me farting and I said no if I farted my face would get bright red so <laughs> so it's not that I can't blush it's just for some reason I don't blush about this um okay let me minimize this so that you can see some of your happy smiling faces um so what's love got to do with it of course wonderful song and I love music so we're going to go into one is the loneliest number. Okay, anyway. Um, what do you think are some of the prayers of some single people? What were your prayers when you were single? Feel free to jump on, unmute yourselves. Hmm. This will be the, the least sexy question of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was to meet somebody nice that we're compatible with. Right. So nice, compatible. Absolutely. To meet somebody. Looks like we've got something in the chat. Connection. Sarah says connection. Absolutely. You want to make that connection with someone who truly understands your soul. Definitely. Anybody have anything else?
Looks like Jane's trying to unmute herself, maybe. Um, friendship. Sydney. Friendship. Absolutely. My husband is my best friend. We became friends first and fell in love after. Uh, and then waited eight years until we got married and then eight, another one. To meet my soulmate, Jane says. Yes, that's the prayer of most singles. And I say this knowing um, my sister, my younger sister, Abby, got married for her first time, first marriage at age 51. She would have been 50, but with the pandemic, that didn't happen. So that was just a couple of years ago. Um, she had many, 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 many prayers. And her prayers were finally answered. Ooh, Nell says touch and warmth. Yes. That you just don't want to be alone on a cold night like this or tomorrow. You want a partner, right? You need someone to go through life with. These are a lot of the feelings, you know, when we ask, regardless of, of um, the, pe the people that we talk about. Now, I'm going to ask you, do you think this is true just because we're Americans? Or is this something that's culturally a phenomenon in every culture? Every culture. Every culture. Tony says every culture. Do you think it has any difference regarding your faith? Or your ethnicity? I think there are cultures where <clears throat> marriage is arranged. So excellent city, yes. Yeah. So and, uh, it's more of a business arrangement than but you can still fall in love with somebody. I was gonna you, say, what do you think are the prayers of those two people who are being match made? Well. I uh, don't pray, so. Okay, well, but I mean, who, <laughs> what do you think they hope for? I think they hope for um, a considerate individual to be their spouse, somebody that they can learn to love, somebody who's intelligent with a sense of humor, who has uh, goals that they, the same sorts of goals that they do, compatibility, yeah. All of those same things. Those so there's I think a one of the things that I think is amazing about um connection and and whether you are formally married or if you have a life partner or if the love has nothing to do with sex but some other kind of connection. There's all different kinds of love. Um it can be a close friend, it could be parent it could be a sibling or another relative it could be like I have a great um fondness for my one of my professors and from when I was in graduate school the first time not the second time you know those are the kinds of things that you know that connection that warmth that um soul recognizing another soul is truly I think someone put it up there um that there's a universality about it and it doesn't matter whether you're from Canada. Yeah, I saw you, Canada. Um, or someone else, you know, it in another country. It transcends all of these human labels that we put on things. And it really is a human thing. Although I think that there are probably a lot of people who attribute human emotions to animals. Um, a wolf, for example, mates for life. I don't know if that's love or not. Um, I do know that there are a lot of animals that have much bigger brains and communicate with our language sometimes, even if they don't actually verbalize it, but they understand what we're saying. Um, I mean, Michelle, you mentioned your dog. I know my dog knows when I'm mad at her. I know she knows when I'm going to get mad at her because she's done something bad. Okay. There's a way of communicating and my dog knows that I love her. So I wanted to share with each of you tonight a um, newsletter reader sent in the following story. It was a busy morning, approximately 8.30 in the morning, when an elderly gentleman in his 80s arrived to have stitches removed from his thumb. He stated that he was in a hurry as he had an appointment at 9 a.m. He took his vital signs and had him take a seat, knowing it would be over an hour before someone would be able to see him. I saw him looking at his watch repeatedly, and I decided, since I wasn't busy with another patient, 
I would evaluate his wound. On example, excuse me, on exam, it was well healed, so I talked to one of the doctors, got the needed supplies to remove his sutures and redress his wound. While taking care of his wound, we began to engage in conversation. I asked him if he and another doc if he had another doctor's appointment this morning, as he was in such a hurry. The gentleman told me no, that he needed to get to the nursing home to eat breakfast with his wife. I then inquired as to her health. He told me that she had been there for a while and that she was living with Alzheimer's disease. As we talked, I asked if she would be upset if he was a bit late. He replied that she no longer knew who he was, that she didn't recognize him for the past five years now. I was surprised and asked him, and you still go every morning even though she doesn't know who you are? He smiled as he patted my hand and said, she doesn't know me, but I still know who she is. I had to hold back tears as he left. I had goosebumps on my arms, and I thought that's the kind of love I want in my life. True love is neither physical nor romantic. True love is an acceptance of all that is, has been, will be, and will not be. That's the kind of love we all hope to have, that people pray for, that we, you know, look forward to in life, that we're promised to sometimes maybe not, you know, as I think that there's a societal pressure in most societies that um, this may be an over-romanticized hope. But for those of you that have it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk. About... Okay, so intimacy. By definition, we're talking about that connection, a deepest of your deepest self with another, appreciating what makes you unique. You're vulnerable, what gifts you bring, and of course, your overall well being. And at one point in our lives, this was all consuming. Um, and I can remember that. I was a freshman in college and I had just met this wonderful young man. We were very good friends, as I said, and eventually we became um, partners in life, partners in crime, partners in work, and um, partners in parenting. And we are now empty nesters almost completely. They're still in college. One of them's about to graduate. So we're having a blast reconnecting and sharing our lives again without mm -hmm. children to worry about. Many nights we sit there and go, do we really need to make dinner? <laughs> so you know, I'm sure most of you can, uh, can relate. Without explanation, each of us knew what the other was feeling, two souls with matching heartbeats. That's different than sexuality. And if we look at some of the psycho uh, psychological models, uh, many of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Intimacy is a higher level. Sexuality is at the bottom of the pyramid. It's right there with food and shelter. It is absolutely a foundation of our survival, not only as the human race, but in our identity, in our need to be close with others, not necessarily intimate, that's actually a different level. And I think it's really this current generation of young adults that's teaching us that that's true. There are a lot of people who have sex nowadays who don't know anybody's name. I'm not saying I agree with it. Good Lord. Um, but I, I do believe that everybody has a time in their lives when that intimacy is one thing, um, but the need for sexuality is always there. I want to see here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So there we go. So we get our little fairy tale house and we have our wonderful lives. And then all of a sudden, whoops, poof, we get this cloud. Ch -ch 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 changes and um this little purple alzheimer's guy says this is not the way it's going to be you're going to have something different in your life and you now have a third partner in your relationship and its name is els or vascular dementia or louis or parkinson or whatever other condition that a person has and what happens is hey, that's enough dude um, what happens is a lot of times we have 
this disconnect between what we see happening in the person with a cognitive change and us. Now, maybe again, it's a different relationship, but I'm going to go with just spouses right now. And we're going to talk about the fact that for spouses living with early stage dementia, this can have a big impact on their relationship. The needs for intimacy may continue and one partner or the other isn't in the same place that they used to be. Um, and that is important to acknowledge and to normalize in every way that we can. Um, Anne-Marie saying, you needed me. I cried a tear, you wiped it dry. I was confused, you cleared my mind. I sold my soul, you bought it back for me. All of these things are, I did this and you were there to clean it up. I had this change and you were walking there right with me. A person with dementia really does experience a lot of changes, both physically and emotionally, because their brain is changing. These are not just moods. This is not just coping. It's, I mean, sometimes there are coping problems, but the changes that we have physically and emotionally are because of the actual neurological changes in the brain. And when we look at neuroscience for explanations, we see where different parts of the brain change. The emotional part though, stays much later into the disease. Um, when, at one point I was working in a long-term care organization and the psychiatrist said, Pam, it's really no different than a 14 year old who is, is interested in having sex. All they know is that it feels good. And I said to him, Dr. Blank, which is pretty much what I called him, Dr. Blank, um, you know, it's not at all the same. A 14 year old is new and experiencing things for the first time. A person living with Alzheimer's or another kind of dementia has a long history, a lifetime of intimacy, of sexuality, for good or for bad, for, for whatever, that these relationships and these experiences that are very important to them. So it's not like someone who's 14. This is someone who's an adult and needs to be treated like an adult. They have adult expectations. They have adult histories. They have adult um, relationships that are adjusting and need uh, time to to reflect and time to change, but and and with help sometimes. Um, I do couples counseling a lot, and you know it's not uncommon that a person with those early stage um, issues now there's a, a a shift in the relationship sexually. Um, they may express their sexual interest because of how the brain changes um, more directly or more openly. They may also it may also impair the disease, may impair their ability to feel empathy. So they really may not have a sense of their partner's needs or their partner's comfort or discomfort level. You are always on my mind. Okay, so depending on the part of the brain that's effective and what medications they're taking, a lot of the antidepressants, and that's usually a frontline defense when a person's being um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, um, they may start instead of on a cholinesterase inhibitor, uh, they may start them on an antidepressant, an SSRI, all of which have the possible and likely side effect of decreased libido. Um, so they may have less or no interest in sex. Sometimes they have more interest in sex. They may have interest but not be able to perform sexually. And they may have changes in their sexual responses, as I mentioned. Sometimes their inhibitions are, are decreased. Um, and sometimes what happens is, is those inhibitions change. They may ask for things that they haven't asked for before, or they may say things that are inappropriate in mixed company. Um, sometimes they may become more sexually aggressive. I don't like that word. Um, in this case, my experience is that it's more sexually expressive than aggressive. Um, and that's going to be important when we talk a little bit at, at the, at later in the presentation about the legalities in care situations and, and in care homes. Um, if your, per your partner experiences any of these symptoms, um, 
you may feel that you can adapt. However, it is very common for the care partners especially. But when you both feel a shift there, um, you can feel loss, grief, real grief, um, anger, embarrassment, frustration, anxiety now. Um, and those are very normal, expected, and typical reactions. I expect that in a married couple when one of you is dealing with Alzheimer's. Um, so it's I know it's hard to say don't feel guilty about this, but recognize in yourself maybe that that guilt may come from an inner shame. You have nothing to be ashamed of. It is because of a brain disease. All right, let me take a pause here and stop sharing for a minute and check in with folks. How are we doing with this? Do we have questions so far? Is this not at all what you expected or is this on target? You know, or did you actually sign up for, you know, financial services or something? And this is not the presentation you meant at all. <clears throat> You know, there is a question um, Julie yep. put in the chat. And Julie, if you want to say this to yourself, you're welcome to, I, or I can read it. Um, so I'll read it. So she says, what, in, what if instead of the man's words, that story you were telling, um, that he remembers his wife, even if he doesn't know him, is not an expression of love after all those years of caretaking, but is an acknowledgement of his obligation and mission and maybe even guilt that brings him to the continue to be there for her day after day. What's love, love got to do with it? Yeah, that is such an important point, Julie. Thank you. Or Julia, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I have a client who feels that all the time right now. And he says, this is my vows. The, this I'm supposed to live my vows. And he goes every day to visit his wife and, and more power to him because, you know, I don't know that I would do the same. We're each of us different people. Notice I waited until my husband was out of the house before I said that. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> He's just dropping off the trash. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that we do look at the caregiver burden and the caregiver stress. And when I say we need to normalize things, it's so that people have an outside person giving them permission that they've done enough because sometimes we don't feel it inside. That guilt keeps us up at night. It can, I mean, we could rack our brains trying to figure out about how to feel about these things. Um, and I think that it's important that we look at the fact that sometimes we're going not because of a love, but because of a sense of obligation. And that regardless of the purpose of why we're going, we want to look at whether or not it's healthy for us. And for some of us, yes, going and being present with our loved one is something that we feel we need to do. And it has nothing to do necessarily with love. Um, it might have to do with any number of other things, maybe because you know that that person is afraid and you want to be able to allay their fears and you, or maybe you just feel guilty about the fact that they're in an assisted living or a nursing home and you promised you would never do that. I, I, that's my next book. After I finish the children's book series, my next book is going to be The Promise because it's probably the worst thing we do to ourselves as humans is promise to not do something for someone where they're living with a situation that's completely beyond our control. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. Um, those of you who are not here because of a spousal relationship or because of being a healthcare provider, Anybody here dealing with adult parents? I'm seeing a couple of nods. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure that I'm meeting everybody's needs here. All right. Let me go back to the presentation. Right. Okay. 
All right. Here's a quote that was featured in 2007 by CBS News. In the advanced stage of John's disease, while he was staying at a care facility, he developed a relationship with another woman as he no longer recognized his wife. The wife was Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And her husband was living in an assisted living. And he forgot who his wife was. That's not uncommon. Um, it doesn't always happen at the end of the disease. Sometimes it can happen in the middle of the disease. Sometimes it's part of an imposter syndrome. Like for instance, especially with um, Lewy body dementia, people living with Lewy body dementia, it's very common for them to have a spousal confusion and start to think that that person who's living with them look they know john but they're not john or sometimes they may have oh this is um this is my john but the imposter john is over the other john is over there um and and that's a condition what we call capgras syndrome c-a-p-g-r-a-s and capgras is really where they think that the people in their lives the actors in their lives are not the same people that they once knew it's actually a very interesting coping strategy that the brain does to help them make sense of their perceived reality. In this case, though, um, the, the client living with dementia, John, did not any, no longer remembered his wife, but still had that need for connection, still felt that need for warmth, and found a woman who seemed to be nice, no. and seemed to be compassionate yeah, and sure yeah. enough developed a relationship with her this is so wow. common that in some organizations yeah. i've been yeah. before we're surprised when people don't couple up now that doesn't mean that everybody's having sex with everybody but it is very common for people to hold hands and not just men and women sometimes it's women and women um, sometimes it's men and two men. But one of the things that we do know is that human beings need other human beings. Oh, that's what I should have put for the song. People who need people hmm. are the luckiest people. Um, Barbara Streisand, I'm not. What Sandra Day O'Connor said is that she, what she focused on is that her husband was happy. And I just had a student tell me the other day in a training. Um, we don't always have to call it therapeutic fibbing. It's the truth they need or the truth they require to be happy. So what Sandra Day O'Connor said is if a person can't remember the vow, how are they breaking the vow? And that this is not something that we should be looking at from a legal perspective at all. I see Sydney's raised her hand. Go ahead, Sydney. What's up? Um, this thing that you said about dual, dual. Uh, my husband seems to think that there's another house someplace. Yes. And there's another bedroom, and there's another everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't realize that there was an actual name for that, and yes. that, um. And he also lots of times thinks I'm his mother or my sister or whatever. Um, so that uh, you just corroborated for me. Yes. Yeah. It's very common. And in fact, sometimes it's a word finding difficulty. I may not remember you or your name and I'm not going to say, oh, there's my wife, Sydney. But I might say, oh, there's my mother, because in my head, that's the first word that I can think of that means there's someone I trust completely. There's someone who I know loves me unconditionally. So it really depends on the situation. And it doesn't really matter. The fact is, is that unless he's saying, who's that crazy woman in my house? You know, yeah. then he feels good and accepting about you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have a client, one of my clients um, locally, she actually lives right around the corner from me, um, said, I went to ask her, I was doing a cognitive assessment to stage where she was, what stage she was at. 
And she said, I said, what's your address? And they've lived in this house for 40 years. And she said, um, I don't remember what this one is. This one is, this one is new. We've only been here a couple of weeks. This one's 85 at a Wanhood trail, I think. And that's exactly what her address was. But she said, no, wait, that's my old house. I don't know what the address here is. So she knew her address, but she thought the place where she was living was a totally different place. Okay. So sometimes we have new symptoms and you may hear about some of these as you're, um, whether you're doing home care or assisted living, nursing homes, um, you may hear spousal confusion. And that is where they know that they're married, but they can't remember which of these lovely ladies is their wife. <laughs> and they get confused about that. Um, and they may actually say, I, um, uh, I'm getting married. There's my fiance. Or yes, that's my husband. Or there's my wife. Um, they may inappropriately, excuse me, inappropriately touch others. And we're going to talk about that language in a minute. And they may have a problem where they are, quote unquote, sexually harassing staff. I personally find that these last two are a little inflammatory for me. And I want to push back on them a little because I think that the language that we use is very, very important. If this is caused by a brain disease, these are not aberrant behaviors. These are not pedophiles or sexual deviants. These are people who are confused because they have a disease that's damaging their brains. We need to be careful with the labels we put on people. So I'm going to get into this a little bit more. Yes, Miss Julia. I have a question. I'm, I'm curious because I, I, I'm in some spousal groups um, mm -hmm. and this topic comes up a lot. And, and when people are contemplating putting their spouses into assisted living or in a memory care unit, it seems that this is a topic that doesn't come up much. Mm -hmm. And yet it's so prevalent. My question is specifically, what's the kind of dividing between men who tend to display that and women who tend to display that in the congregate setting environment? Do you have any great you know, kind of question? Session? Great question. Well, it's generationally different. We're starting to see a shift where everybody is displaying it. Doesn't matter about your sexual identity or your gender or your previous experiences, married or unmarried. It used to be that unmarried or long widowed women, this was never an issue in a nursing home. This is like even before assisted livings were popular. Um, and it was literally all these dirty old men. And that's what they used to refer to. Oh, that Jeremy, he's just a dirty old man. Well, no, he's not. You know, what turns our heads at 25 doesn't stop when their eyes are older. And they may have been catcalling all along. Now, I can remember as a kid growing up, so I'm 55, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, we used to go out as a family of five, father, mother, three children, to a restaurant. And dad would look at the waitress and say, do you take orders to go? Good. Get your hat and your coat and let's go. <laughs> oh, my God. So embarrassing. But we're the ones who told him, dad, you can't say that anymore. I know you think you're funny. Now, I just want to say for the record, my father does not yet have dementia this is a generational thing he thinks he's just being funny he doesn't say it anymore because he has three daughters and we beat him over the head and said knock it off dad you can't do that would you want some guy saying that to me and that's when he finally figured it out so some of this is generational now i'm not saying that tolerating inappropriate conversations is something that we should do, but we have to remember that as dementia progresses, some of the language skills in the right side of their brain is what's preserved. And that includes what Tipa Snow calls the forbidden language. 
socially inappropriate conversations, and swear words. So you put some of those together, and that's a skill they've retained. And meanwhile, they've unlearned the filters that we taught them as parents that says, nope, can't say that in mixed company. Nope, you don't say that in public. Stop pointing. Those are learned skills. So when people get into communal settings, now you've got all of this brain disease going on and people start having conversations or doing things that they may have only done behind a closed door, but they forgot to close the door now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Julia? Well, I mean, the generational part would explain certainly a segment of men above a certain age who grew up in a certain way. And I get that. I mean, I, I think my experience is everything that my spouse had, let's call it the Michigas, right? Yep. All my spouse's stuff came through into dementia, right? So if there were things that triggered my spouse yep. before dementia, those things loom large sexuality and and the way you speak to people and those filters i get it but i'm i'm just i'm curious about the different generations aside mm -hmm. if in the congregate setting are women just as predatory and i mean i don't mean i don't mean it disparagingly i mean do women become as predatory in a way um in these settings as men do is so it a, not is it a universal program I will, I will Not, give you an, I was going to say, can I, I, I had a client once when I had a care management agency. And so when I had a client once who the husband moved his wife into senior living and the senior living community very kindly said, you know, for us to get to know her, I really recommend that you don't come for a week or so. Let us just kind of get her footing together. And he, he was fine with that. She was in memory and he went to visit her. And when he went to visit her, it was later in the day and she was sitting on a couch and she was holding another man's hand. And when he walked in, he said, and she, and my wife is holding somebody else's hand and, and, and the staff got very, got very defensive. And he, and his response to that was, cause he didn't look at it as sexual, but they thought he was looking at it as sexual. They had held hands on the couch every night to watch TV. And he was thrilled that she found comfort in someone else when he wasn't there to sit and hold hands on a couch and watch TV. So I know, Julie, I'm not actually answering your question, but what I'm saying to you is that every interaction is not necessarily sexualized by nature. What she was finding was comfort in somebody else. And the staff could have interpreted that as being something other than what it was, he knew exactly what it was and was not bothered by it. And I think, thank you, Michelle, that's really helpful. I think part of it is because of how we're socialized to mm -hmm. express affection. And women, again, overgeneralizing, tend to seek terms of endearment, touching, holding hands, um, whereas men, historically, it's much more about the physical act of love. Um, unless it's Valentine's week and they're all focused on the flowers and the candy. <laughs> Not all of them, probably. But I think that what's important is as, as the generations change, we will see that expression level up. Um, but Michelle's right. Females are just as likely, if not more, to seek companionship. It's just that the men's companionship or the male's companionship tends to be much more physically expressive. And so therefore it sets the alarm bells because now we're talking about is it assault, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Two people holding hands, no one's going to get hysterical over. It, one of the one of my favorite stories to share is the when I was working for the Alzheimer's Association here in Connecticut, my grandmother was living in a nursing home. My grandmother had Alzheimer's. We were her caregivers for nine of the 12 years she had the disease. And 
the we went to talk to the deputy director of the Department of Public Health here in Connecticut. And it was so frustrating because they expected that nursing homes would need to call the police when we had an incident, a resident on resident. It, it was an altercation. That's not the word we used at that point. Um, I don't remember what it was exactly, but this was, this was way back in the, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And she, the deputy director sat there with her arms crossed and said, Pam, are you telling me you don't want us to do anything if your grandmother gets raped? And I said, no, I'm saying that there's a big difference between rape and two people seeking companionship. And the challenge that we have here is that facilities need a line in the sand so that they know policy-wise what to do. So when men, when men get more sexually expressive, that puts the facilities on the other line, on the other side of the line. Again, not sure if that's answering your question or meeting your needs, but no, in my experience, there's really no difference in frequency um, or uh, number of incidents except in how it's recorded or documented. This is a really taboo subject and, you know, props to all of you who logged on for this or signed up to watch this video because this is a really taboo subject and it's taboo in our culture, um, sex in general. I mean, gosh, can you remember when Madonna was groundbreaking because she came on and did all kinds of gyrations and my gosh, now it's halftime show on uh, the Super Bowl. No worries. Let's you know, and she wasn't even the first, but there was a difference between Elvis doing it and Madonna. So, all right, let's keep going here. Okay, for healthcare professionals, number one, we have to remember that humans are sexual beings, and that is true throughout their lifespans. People with dementia still have needs for intimacy and connection, as I've already said, and that their behavior could very well be misinterpreted by staff or peers as being sexual in nature, just like Michelle said, uh, impairments in communication really do complicate this because our expressions and our needs for intimacy are sometimes miscommunicated. We had a gentleman in a nearby town south of Hartford that was the police were called because he was exposing himself in a park. Well, he never actually exposed himself. He was a person living with dementia and he was fidgeting with his zipper and someone thought he was about to expose himself. So all the police come in and they're, you know, getting ready to write him up and as a deviant. And that's not at all what was happening. So we need to be very careful about what's going on. Is this person really, are they masturbating or do they need to use the toilet? Um, you know, is this a lifelong pattern? There are some people who don't wear clothes. There are some people who don't wear underwear. And now we're putting briefs on them and we're frustrated because they keep trying to take them off. Well, my first question is, is this guy used to wearing undergarments of any kind? So part of this has nothing to do with sex, but our response to their progressive needs. We have to find out whether or not a behavior is inappropriate or unacceptable. So what's the song, Baby Got Back? Um, I like big butts and I cannot lie. You want to get your mind. So part of this is, uh, I, I was remembering a, a friend's television, uh, TV show, uh, friends they had when Ross and Rachel had a baby and they all started singing that song and they were like, oh, sing that song to our baby. That would be inappropriate. Okay. Is it really an inappropriate song? Well, it depends. I mean, it's a catchy tune kind of like singing it. I like dancing to it, but the lyrics are really not okay. So we have to look at, is the song lyric a problem or is it something else? Same thing with behaviors. We have to focus on the behavior. Is it really inappropriate? Most of the time it's not. And if you think about all of the things that everybody does, think about all the New Yorkers and all of the different kinds of sex people have. It's only because we're now putting them in a 
public housing, if you will, although it's not public housing, but you know, a communal living that it becomes an issue. Um, is it a safety issue? That could be true. Is it hypersexuality? Fewer than 25% actual of people living with dementia actually have problems with hypersexuality. It's very unusual. It's really that either it's locationally unacceptable or the partner is confused and, and there's confusion about that or they've miscommunicated. Is it unacceptable? Like I said, could be the situation. We want to look at the triggers. What happened before? We want to look at the environment, the activity, activity levels and internal triggers. Um, I share with staffs all the time you know, in some families, the husband and wife only have take showers after sex in the evening. Otherwise, if it's just to get clean, it's a morning chore, you know, the ADL care. So if we're in the evening, because we as healthcare professionals say, we've got to balance the uh, assignments. So, you know, uh, Michelle, you're going to start bathing Mr. Smith in the evening. Well, now Michelle comes in and says, hey, Mr. Smith, it's time for your shower. He's thinking, woohoo, we're getting busy. So part of this is because of the unspoken messages, the unreported normal life patterns. That doesn't mean that Mr. Smith is a sex pot. It just means that he's confused about the partner and what she's trying to say. Um, we also have to investigate the consequences and especially for a staff, their response. We never, 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 never want to shame, tease, scold, or argue. Um, we want to stop, redirect. We want to reorient the person as to who we are and our role and maybe clarify what it is that we need to do. Then we need to look at, did it help? You know, if I could take a step back or set, start with, okay, I'm going to always call him Mr. Smith instead of James. Or I'm going to say, Mr. Smith, it's time for a wash up now because shower has a different meaning. It really depends on what you find that works. When you find that answer, staff, make sure you share it with the rest of the team. So check the communication. Um, be aware of verbal and nonverbal communication, especially with residents, um, how you use touch tone of voice, hand gestures, eye contact. Is your clothing appropriate? I'm wearing, what is this, like a zebra print, V-cut. If I leaned over a client, I'd be given quite a show. And then I'm going to be surprised when they grab me. That's not fair. That's not appropriate. Um, it's important to remember that the resident's response may be totally appropriate based on what I'm providing to them for cues in our conversation, in our communication. And how it makes you feel is more important than belittling that resident for need to express sexuality. You can say things like, I don't feel comfortable with this. I'm going to get someone else to come help because I'm not feeling comfortable right now. That's totally fine. Um, make sure that the resident is safe first, obviously. All right, let's take another check-in and see what everyone else is thinking about. Is this any questions again, any comments, any negative experiences or experiences that you would want to have me kind of target to answer? Oh, they're all shy now, Michelle. I'll ask a question of everybody. Oh, for anybody whose person is in a congregate care facility of any kind, was there ever, when you came in or at any point, a meeting with the administration or the staff to talk about exactly these things, about how staff will, what the plan is, what's the plan of action? And did they did they ask you about these particular things about the dynamics of your person and and how they are approached or if they are um like what they're how they respond to this so that there could be a 
a, a team dynamic a set, a plan of action, the same way we would with a kid who had some special needs in education. We'd have, you know, a menu of stuff, how we're going to approach all this stuff. Has anybody had that experience or have you not had that experience in your congregate living where whatever level, wherever that might be? Anybody have it? Conversation with a formal pro professional team at admission, right, Julia? Either at admission or, you know, like during, I, I'm saying this because I'm not in the, that setting at this point. I'm, my my wife is at home and um, uh, middle stage. And, and I would love to never be in that situation, but who knows, right? I have a good friend who is also a social worker and also works in elder care and has been done, doing a lot of work, whose mother just went into one and into a, one of them. And the approach was not what I would have expected, what she expected would have been, okay, let's talk about what your mother's personality is like, like how does she respond? And, and you know, 80 year old woman with, with middle late stage dementia, you know, what, is she friendly to people? Does she respond to, does she like to be approached from the front? Does she, like any, those kinds of things that are in all this. And then also about, is she a person who likes to be touched? Is she a person who, who expresses herself? Does she cry easily? Does she get angry? Any of those conversations, none of those took place. They got the don't show up for, I think it was two weeks for them. I hate that. <laughs> um, and they, they broke it. They broke it, uh, the brother broke it. But but the thing, and this is a highfalutin place that costs thousands and thousands of dollars and is very highly rated. And when her mother got there after living in her own townhouse, from, I'm sorry to dominate, but her mother lived in her own townhouse for many years with her aides and with assistance until it just became impossible to manage any longer, comes into this place. And when my friend goes there, all of her toiletries are gone. And and her, she was like, where's my mother's shampoo and her her skin cream and all this stuff? It's like been living in her dignity for all these years. And they said, oh, no, it's our policy. We'll ah. give things back as we you know, figure it out. I was like, well, why do we have a meeting? Why don't you tell me about this? Why? So I just want to know what people's experience is. And as we're talking about sex and sexuality and intimacy and expressions, how are they asking us? Or, or for those of you that are staff members, have you ever participated in, in one of these meetings? Does it sound like something that might be a good idea where you work? Of course, it's a good idea. Julia, I will tell you, and for those of you, the rest of you who are wondering, it is exceedingly rare to have this conversation, especially at admission. It's usually not a conversation we have until there's an issue. And by then, we've already risked the dignity of the person that we love. So what happens is, and I'm not saying that this is the way it should be. Oh, Julia, you're on mute. Julia, you're on mute. It's the biases that have come in by waiting. Absolutely. They're, they're fixed. It's like that reaction to the holding hands. Absolutely. Right? If they had just talked to the husband at the very beginning, then, then the staff, re, which, you know, that, all those social things that we have and we bring it in. Right. Right. Staff brings it in too. I know it in my home care. I see it so, because culturally we're all different. Religiously we're all different. Um, Age we're all different. I'm a lesbian. I've got straight people working with us. That's hard for them, yeah. right? So I'm looking to improve this world that we live. <laughs> and for anybody- Thank you, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. So in my experience, and I've been working on this topic for almost two decades now, more than that. Oh my God, how old am I? Okay, so what happens, uh, one of the best resources in the world on this subject um, is actually in New York City, what used to be called the Jewish home of Riverdale or the Hebrew home of Riverdale. I don't remember what its new name is, Michelle. They are the ones who actually wrote these standards for care planning, for having conversations, and for assessing these issues. The problem is, is that most people don't do a sexual assessment. They created this very long sexual assessment. I'm not so sure it has to be all that detailed. 
um, you can probably ask, you know, kind of like we do the depression stuff now, one or two questions to see how much of an issue this is. But we need to know, the problem is we may not always, the caregivers may not always know. Does this person have a sexual trauma history? Does this person have some kind of, um, I don't want to say atypical, but some kind of sexual expression that the staff should be prepared about? Um, I was walking through a, a long-term care facility today, and they have a woman who has a traumatic brain injury on their dementia unit who refuses to wear clothes. Now, she may have been an exhibitionist her whole life. Who knows? But that's something we would need to know. That doesn't mean we're not going to take care of the person or say, nope, we can't take care of that here. That's wrong. We just need to know so that we can provide the best care with dignity and respect that they deserve. Um, and again, Julia, to your, to answer your question, it is rare, very rare. Matter of fact, it's one of the things that makes me a very popular speaker because I do a lot of in-services for staff. Staffs don't know what to do about that. And that includes the facilities that I originally worked in. And we all assume a couple, there are these myths, right? Number one, that men are the only one who initiate sex. We know that's not true. Women are always just sweet and loving people. They're kind and generous. We know that staffs don't ever have to deal with this, that when they're doing personal care, it's personal care. True. And that whatever the leader of that organization's beliefs are, are automatically shared by all of the staff. Also not true. These are some of the biggest myths in healthcare. And I see Jane, your head's about falling off there because you're going, yep, yep, nope, that's right, yep, yep, absolutely. So I appreciate the nods and and shaking of heads to to affirm my my experience here. I think what's important to remember is that if if the statistics are that one in every three or four women have been sexually assaulted, that's true not only for our residents but also for our staffs. And we need to do better for everybody. Okay, the statistics aren't that much different for males. And males living in long-term care also have needs to be protected and feel safe. And when a person's doing personal care, and at this point, if the loved one is a stranger, everybody's a stranger, that's going to be perceived as assault. And then you're wondering why someone gets punched. I think their response may be very appropriate in their perceived reality. All right. When, when I, lived in, yeah, I lived in Newington and was involved in a group that um, actually had state, state representation as well as local representation. And it was to address this very issue of the, well, of the, of the gay community, the lesbians, uh, gay men, and the trans. And what we did is we put together a program and we took that program uh, and worked with uh, nursing homes. Yep. And, and that was a wonderful thing. However, you know, here's the issue. And, and it's with I everything. Find my pens. I can make a note of this. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Ms. Janet. The, the, the person who actually um, uh, headed up or was a lot responsible for the program is the woman who um, runs, who's the head of the Parks and Rec I'm sorry, the Senior Citizens um, Center in, in Newington. And yep. so she organized it. Yep. And and it was the only problem is that when we went in, we talked with people, we had an agenda, we had contacted SAGE, which is the yep. you know New York organization and had a, they have wonderful programs. And we would talk to the, you had to have, like you said, you have to have the director support, the, the head of the person. But those people that really are doing those interactions day to day, they're not always there all the time. And, and we're looking at a cultural change, which is not, doesn't take place overnight. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a lesbian also, and we use some of the films that, um, that were really affecting many of the gay men, really, more than the lesbians, because the gay men are less acceptable than, and, than women. And, and their, you know, sexual expression sometimes or affectionate mm -hmm. expression, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
So I, the problem is there, and I certainly, you know, agree with Julia that it needs to be addressed, but it needs to be addressed over and over and over again. It's, I'm so glad you said this, Janice, because I don't know if you're aware, but we did a similar talk a year ago. Now, oh. I'm willing to bet that none of you were on that presentation a year ago. Maybe you were, I don't know. But I think that you're right. First of all, it needs to be said over and over and over again. Second of all, thank you for your work on that task force. That was important work. And thank you for everybody else who champions some of these experiences and, and takes on the role of advocacy. I appreciate that immensely. Um, what's interesting to me though, Janice, would be to go back to that group and say, okay, now what happens when the person gets dementia? That because part now, you know, I'm sorry, that part we didn't deal with, right. actually. Well, you know? and this is a big issue because unfortunately what happens, and it's not just Connecticut, it's everywhere, because I've been told when the feds change their minds, then we'll change ours. The problem is when two people are sexually expressive and there's a perception that they cannot consent then the facilities call the police. Yeah. So imagine your moms, your dads, your partners are now having the cops called on the first of all for an incident they don't even remember. Right. Okay. Second of all, over something like holding hands or kissing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the facilities that I consult with had a sweet, sweet, sweet man who, not that it matters if he's sweet or not, but he's Italian and he's very expressive and he's from the old school and you touch the women and you tell them how cute they are and you pat them on the fanny as they walk by. And sure enough, they ended up calling the police on him. And he had, well, the last time, so they the last time I finally got them to not call the police. Unfortunately, one of the things that happened was he became physically aggressive when they tried to redirect him and tell him no. Mm -hmm. So now because of their reaction, he's physically aggressive. And so now he gets transferred to a psych hospital. This is wrong. That's right. In my 34 years of experience, this is wrong. We've got to stop this, which I'm working on. Okay. So, Let's move on. Oh, I see their um, share screen. All right. For those of you who are providing personal care, whether it's to your family member or to um, uh, uh, as a, in a professional role, um, some of the strategies that we use, and part of this is, like I said, is communication. First of all, there is no rule that says that a person has to be naked in order to get a bath or a shower. One of the tricks that we sometimes use, especially if someone is confused with their communication and what it means to have someone helping them in the shower, touching their body, is that we bathe the person with that loose fitting clothing on. And then we reach up underneath for washing the body. We can also do no rinse soap products. We can do bed baths or all kinds of different things. Although my experience is doing a bed bath on a person with dementia who is confused and, and sexually expressive invites more sexual expression. Um, one of the other strategies is a palm over hand. So normally we do a palm under, but for this, we're gonna take the resident's hand with our palm on top and guide them to clean themselves. Okay, that's a, a really effective strategy. And that way we're also um, able to do much more of their personal care. Many people who need help with ADLs, once they start doing it by themselves, they can actually be independent. So they may not need constant uh, physical assist. You may also want to have safe objects for the person to hold. Um, you may have some shampoo, a, a loofah, um, a washcloth, a sponge, something easy that's not going to hurt if they decide to bang you on the head with it. Um, sometimes I've even seen, I don't like bath toys, but um, 
pool noodles. Sometimes you can do that and just play a nice game or something to take it off of the what can otherwise for the caregiver be an unpleasant task. People don't like being done to. And universally, that is true when it comes to people with dementia. They are more likely to have that conflict when you're focused on the task instead of on them. So if you have a conversation and you talk about, oh, tell me about the football game. Well, do you like the commercials or put on music, their favorite kind of music and sing along? Something that distracts them from the unpleasant task um, that is in, it's not going to work for all situations, but my goodness, if you're having problems with bathing, even just reducing it by 50% is a win. Our scout motto, be prepared. Um, I want you to think about what are you as staffs, those of you who are staff members, prepared to respond to with dignity and respect, okay? If we have one resident, issues that are of a sexual nature, whether it's during personal care or masturbation, how would you respond? Two residents with dementia who seek or find each other and develop a relationship, however that's defined. Are you okay with that? Two residents with a dementia who engage in sexual acts but have no relationship. Is that okay or no? A couple, one who has dementia, or a couple, husband and wife, or uh, wife and wife, husband and husband, who both have dementia. Two residents, one with dementia, one without. And again, like we said before, what about LBT? LGBTQ plus relationships. Most of the time when we're talking about education for staff in long-term care settings or home care, they're not getting this level of education. And just being able to think through that in a safe learning environment will help them respond more appropriately if they're all of a sudden faced with it you know, when they're going in to deliver a food tray and all of a sudden they find two people having sex. That actually happened to me once when I was working in a nursing home. It was not a fun thing to walk in a, into. It was, it was very, it wasn't that it was upsetting. It was just shocking. I was there to deliver lunch. That's not what I thought I was going to walk in on. In fairness, they had closed the door. I'm the one who had the wrong agenda. They were doing everything appropriately. Well, I don't know if they were doing it appropriately, but they had tried to maintain privacy. Um, other considerations. When two residents have been together, touching, holding, stroking each other. When we're dealing with um, long-term care settings, we do need to do an investigation. I don't like that word because it sounds like someone did something bad or we're going to find the perpetrator and who's the victim or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But in nursing home and assisted living talk, that needs an investigation. We're going to separate it and assess what's going on. We want to distract the residents from each other during that information gathering time. We want to document only things that we observed, not what we think happened, not what we've heard has been going on, only things that we observed. And we want to do that in a very non-emotional way clinical really way we don't want to say and he dropped his pants and then whipped it out i mean that's just wrong and too emotionally laden we want to say he disrobed that he you know you know whatever it was that was happening we want to say only what we observed and in very non-emotional language we also want to inform the responsible party or family member, but we need to remember this, that families often do not want to be updated. Now, some of the spouses do, and or partners. They absolutely want to know what's going on, but there are some spouses that are under so much stress that all these reports about him holding hands, kissing someone else, found him in bed saying, come here, come here, come here, is too distressing. Increases their cortisol. Therefore, their risk of getting dementia on their own is increased because of what we're doing. So we want to have conversations. One facility I worked in, um, husband was definitely starting a relationship with a, uh, with a single uh, individual female. Sometimes it's any available female. Sometimes they really do target in on, on one individual. And so uh, Mr. Jean had found his one 
person here in our lovely facility and his wife d just couldn't handle it she was so distressed and upset by it and i had said to her i said d i don't want to keep calling you with all of these reports do you want me to call you and she said no i don't want to hear about these i said how can i and that's fine we just document that we put that on the care plan two people seeking each other's companionship is not sexual abuse it is not assault um and i'll talk more about that in a second i said to jean what can we do to make this less uncomfortable for you and she said i don't know i just get so upset when i see him with another person and it's fine i'm glad he has someone but it's just upsetting to me to see it I said that's totally fine there's what we're going to do i know you won't live literally around the corner i want you to call us when you're leaving your house or when you're in our parking lot and let us know that you're coming in we will separate them and you never have to admit that this is even happening and we're not going to throw it in your face every time you come we're going to treat both of you with compassion what's happening in his brain is happening he recognized her when she was there but he needed companionship for when she wasn't and that was okay they never got to a point of sexual expression it was literally just those intimate friendly loving times um and that was fine so we had that all on our care plan um to do, 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 do informing the supervisor and appropriate care team members in this HIPAA world I I know we're all about who needs to know a lot of times we're not telling the people who need to know um and that appropriate care team may be the housekeeper who's going to walk in on things or find things that need cleaning or um the dietary aide who's going to be delivering the meals when that person's masturbating you know, they need to know how to respond and what to report as well. We do need to protect people from sexual abuse and assault. Just because two people have dementia doesn't mean that one of them isn't going to be assaulting the other person. Again, there are some not very nice people who get dementia too. And we do uh, background checks on people who work in nursing homes, but we don't yet do background checks on the people going into nursing homes and assisted livings. And we're probably not real far from that. That said, there are a lot of people who are on a registry that just didn't do anything that is assaulting. Think about it. Um, so we have to be very careful about those things. I'm not in any way saying that you should now go on some registry site and look up your, your loved one's roommate. That's not what I'm saying. Um, sexual abuse requires an intent. And when we're talking about what's happening legally we have to think about what's happening in the brain and whether or not someone has the capacity to consent and whether or not they can commit intentionally commit harm and that is a real important thing to have on the care plans when we're talking about whether or not we have to call the cops because it's the intent that defines the statutes on assault. And when we're calling the police, they're going to come because we've made the report. Sometimes nowadays they don't even. And that's a sad state of affairs, but that's a whole different issue. Um, what we need to document, and we may need a, a physician or an APRN to document and to do an assessment as to whether or not that person has the capacity to commit harm. Or if this is just people seeking affection, there's a huge difference between affection and assault. So how do we list that on a sample problem? Impaired decisional capacity, resident unable to deliberately take advantage of another, spousal confusion with another resident, intimacy seeking behaviors or some similar wording. Goal? Resident will have a positive rapport with others in public areas, will not engage in sexual activity with other residents, need for intimacy will be met with non-sexual approaches. One of the things that was studied, I think that's my last topic for sharing, we'll have the rest of this be conversational. One of the things that I think is really important is that um, there, there was a study done many years ago, but it was a pretty well designed study. People need touch. We all know that. 
Um, there have been tons of studies done with people who are denied human touch and terrible mental health consequences happen as a result, which is a little redundant, but bear with me. What they found is that people with dementia need in the early stages twice as much touch as they used to get. In the middle stages, they need three times as much touch. In the end stage, they need four times as much touch. Yes, Julia, I will come to that in a minute. Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, what happens though is the exact opposite. In the early stages, when they get that label and they start having these weird changes in their memory or their ability to do the stuff that they used to do, they get half as much touch as they used to. By the end of the disease, they're at a 400% deficit between what they need and what they get. And by the way, the clinical we touch that we do during care doesn't count as touch. It's just not the same as a friend giving you a hug. Um, my husband is fine, but we're going through some medical situation with him. And a friend just came up to me today and just gave me a hug. I almost cried. It was just the nicest thing. She didn't say anything, but she knew I needed a hug. I'm a hugger. I hug people. And when you're having medical things, people, you know, in this HIPAA world, we're not going to touch you and we're not going to ask. We need hugs. We need a warm embrace sometimes. We need a rested arm or hand on our back, you know, or a shoulder rub just to let people know, hey, I'm thinking about you. Um, people need that. Not everybody. I think as someone mentioned before, not everybody's okay with touch. We need to know that. Fine to ask, but when I'm old and get dementia, give me a hug. I'm going to need it. Okay. And I'm also going to talk sexy all the time because I do now. Well, not overly sexy, but I'm going to know all those sexy songs. All right. Um, Julia inquired about ST, STDs and STIs. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Big issue. Highest rates of new HIV infections are in the villages in Florida among 50 and older. And it's mostly women. Um, and what's happening is they can't get pregnant. So who needs those old condoms anymore, right? Uh, yeah, it's a big issue. It's a big problem. And it's not just HIV. Um, it's, you know, it's gonorrhea. It's all the other STIs as well. Um, these are big issues. No, they do not routinely test for them. In fact, I had a resident who had some really different behaviors and they started testing him for a UTI and it went a little further because some lab was off. Turns out he had asymptomatic, is it gonorrhea? No, what's one of the other ones that can live in your body for a long, long time? Syphilis. And they figured, syphilis, thank you. That's the one. Um, Long-term syphilis that had lived in his body, asymptomatic since he was in Vietnam. And his wife never knew. We had to get her tested. Um, she was fine, but you know, we had no idea. And it's good that we found out because he was one of our sexually expressive folks. So we have to observe those kinds of things and be aware of them. But no, we don't routinely test for them yet. I'm sure there will come a time where, yes, we will routinely test. And it's probably not far off. I've said for years, it's only a matter of time before bingo is out and Chippendales is in. You know, it's just, it's not on our activity calendars yet, but. You know, this is the generation coming into our long-term care facilities that burned their bras and Woodstock. Everybody was sleeping with everybody and doing all kinds of drugs. It's only a matter of time before the entire culture of long-term care changes for good. I don't know if it'll be for good, but that's a whole different topic. All right. What haven't I answered for you? What questions do you have? Michelle, what else is in the chat that I might have missed? There is, I don't see anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did I answer all of your questions? Some of you look like I've shocked you. No. <laughs> Some of you are hiding behind a, a lack of camera. And I worry about you. You don't even have to turn your camera on. Just go ahead, unmute yourselves and ask. 
Anybody have issues with parents? Sometimes, you know, and I didn't say this before, but sometimes it does happen where a person living with dementia does become confused to the relationship and does become sexually expressive to their adult child or sometimes to grandchildren in the family. Those are always very sensitive issues and it's not always easy. And for some families that requires a separation, unfortunately, and or a medication. And I'm not sure which is worse, the chemical restraint or a physical restraint or admission to a long-term care setting. But you know, we none of the decisions that we have to make when it comes to dementia care are decisions we want to have to make. Um, so it's it's a matter of a lesser of two or three evils. Okay. Are we all ready to go watch uh, Wheel of Fortune or what's up? Shall we wrap up? Absolutely. Was this helpful? Okay. Thank you. Some thumbs Get up, some, some thumbs nods. Up. Excellent. Yeah, thank I do you. encourage you. Oh, I'm sorry, Carol. What did you say? No, no. I just said thank you. It was helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I do encourage you to 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 talk about these issues in the long-term care settings or in the home care settings where you all live in a very sensitive way. Uh, with a lot of dignity and respect. And just remember, this is just natural. It's just as natural as the incontinence. It's just as natural as them forgetting how to feed themselves with silverware. It's just a part of the disease. It's part of our humanity. All righty. All right. Oh, yeah, Julia? Did nope, you she was just giving us the peace sign. Oh, she's giving us the peace sign. Great. So... Thank you. Thank you, Pam, oh as gosh, always, for, for coming and leading this, a very important topic. I know it's really, you know, we all think about this. Um, how could we not? And when changes in relationships happen, um, it's hard to navigate as a care partner. So I appreciate you tackling this topic head on. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming so that I didn't just sit here talking to Michelle. Although that's always fun too. She was my work <laughs> wife there for quite a while. So know that we'll be sending out a um, a survey. You should be receiving that tomorrow. Um, Pam slides also will be available for you. Um, if you want to reference them, you can also watch it on our YouTube channel again. Um, and any feedback is always good feedback. So we always appreciate what always. you have to say. Um, because, and any interesting topics that you want going forward, um, we're, we're all ears. So thank you again for being here. I appreciate you all being here and we will see you again next month. And happy thank Valentine's you. Day. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine. Happy Valentine's. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.